This is your this is this is your main metal place. Oh, I'm gonna grab another battery in case I run out. Oh yeah. Down. I don't know what you want to see or look like. Wow, you about. got a KISS pinball machine. Awesome. Holy smokes, look at this. Jeez. Golly, it's like a shrine down here. That's what I've been doing since I've been uh, like 12 or something. I started my record collection. Starts from A and goes all the way to Z. All the way around? Yeah. So that, this around. is A. A yeah. all the way down to, uh, what is that, J. And then the J's pick up down there. And run oh, all the oh way I down. see. So first floor, first A. A through J and then J through T. And then uh, the T's through the Z's over there. And all the compilation albums and stuff. Yeah, these are some priest Japanese singles. They go. These go for. You can get them anywhere to 100, 150 dollars a piece. Did you get them at the time when they came no, out? Unfortunately, or? no, <laughs> no, I didn't. I couldn't afford them at the time. But yeah, my Alice Cooper singles are probably have more Cooper singles than anything. They start like right here and go all the way back to about here. My Thin Lizzy singles too start about here and they go all the way till about there. Have a lot of them autographed and stuff, but uh, yeah, they're worth a lot of money. Dude. And uh, over here is my CD collection. I'm a big vinyl buff. I like vinyl better than CDs. Um, I have a pretty decent turntable here. If you have a decent turntable, I think they sound better than CDs. Have a lot more bottom end to it. Of course, you hear the clicking of the record, but that doesn't bother me at all. And uh, of course, my CD collection. Some things you have to get on CD because they're not on vinyl. But what I like about vinyl is the album covers, the gatefold sleeves, the inner sleeves, just the neat packaging. So So you were a beer can collector? In the seventies, yeah, when I was in uh probably fifth grade, fourth grade, something like that. I had um all these stored at my parents' house when I moved out. They're telling me we're gonna do these cans. I was somewhere where I saw them all over a wall. I said, Cool, I'll cover one of my walls with them. So that's what I did. That's pretty neat. And um this one was cool because it had Thin Lizzy listed on it. I brought this home from Sweden. When I was over in Sweden, I brought, had to bring it home because it had Thin Lizzy on it. Um, uh, what I'll show you here, I was telling you that I started a fanzine in the early 80s, and this was my first issue of Grindr. Um, this band Overkill we put on the cover. I was told years ago by a couple members of the band we were the first magazine to ever put them on a cover. And they've gone on to, they've probably done somewhere between 10, 15 albums. They're known worldwide. There's a shot of Rob from uh, the Civic Center in Baltimore. Wow. That was on the Screaming for Vengeance tour. What year was Screaming for Vengeance? 82. That was at 82. And you were there? Yes. That was, uh, that was a big, one of my favorite concert memories because um, I was, like I said, a big Priest fanatic. And I wanted to go, they came around in 1981 on the Point of Entry tour. And I wanted to go. My parents would not let me go. My brother and his friends were gone, and for certain reasons, she didn't want me gone with them and her friends. And I was pretty upset about it. But I got to see him the following year, Screaming for Vengeance. I got to go, and that was a big deal for me. It was like seeing at that point they were the biggest icons in my life. Probably was Priest. You know, I was and going to see that show made an open for them then too on their Number of the Beast tour. But seeing Priest that night, that was like that was one of my favorite concert memories to this date. No doubt about it. All right, I guess we'll start off with Rock and Roll. This is their first Priest album. And this here is, I wouldn't really call it a heavy metal album. It's more hard rock. Um, I think they were, at this point, they haven't quite um, got their style down, which they became known for. It's a great album, though. I mean, there's songs like Never Satisfied on there that are just great songs. Um, this album came out, let me just double check here, make sure I'm telling you right. Yeah, 74, this album came out in 74. Uh, great album, it's more considered a hard rock album. A lot, it's one of the most, a lot of Priest fans don't really, this isn't one of the top ones on their list, but I, I think it's a very important album. Uh, great album, these songs had been around for a while before it finally got recorded, but it's a, it's a hard rock album, definitely a good album. They were just kind of, at that time, establishing their style. Hadn't quite followed in. This is just another pressing of Rockarola. Um, okay, this album here, Sad Wings of Destiny. 
I consider to be one of my favorite albums of all time. I think that this album is just superb in every way. Uh, the vocals on this album are yet to be touched. I mean, they're just glass. They're like glass. They're in great vocals, great songs. Some of my favorite songs of all time are on this album, that being uh, Dreamer Deceiver and Victim of Changes, two of my all-time favorite songs ever. This album is you know, classic to just about anybody. A lot of people that uh, didn't really follow Priest, they go back and hear this album, don't think it's quite a metal album. Um, the songs on here are definitely metal songs. And uh, like Genocide, Tyrant, Ripper, all of them are considered classic Priest songs. Same with uh, Victim of Changes. One of my favorite albums. Um, I think this album kind of got discovered more a few years after it was out. Um, this is just another pressing of it. Different countries, different record labels, something like that. Uh, Sin After Sin, another great album. This came out in 1977. It was produced by Roger Glover of Deep Purple. This album was even getting closer to that Priest sound that they had... Uh, already pretty much established. This just kind of finalized it. The production on this album is a little, um, a little dry, but you know, Sinner is a popular uh, Priest classic off this album. Definitely a pretty good album. This is 77 that this was. It's just another uh, pressing of the album. This is like with a gatefold sleeve from, from uh, I believe this is from Spain. No, Argentina. This is an Argentina pressing. Same album, just different cover, different picture sleeve. This is just a best of picture disc. Uh, this is a bootleg album from 78. It's just the best of album, regular album. Now this here I think is uh, definitely a, another one of the greatest albums that exist, uh, Stained Class. This was definitely, I think at this point, 78. I'd consider this heavy metal. Songs in here were just incredible. You know, all the songs. Uh, Beyond the Realms of Death is another one of my favorite songs. But you have stuff like uh, Stained Class, the title track. Exciters, another Priest classic, Saints in Hell, and actually this album is the album that unfortunately got notoriety for the wrong reasons. Uh, I forgot what year it was, a couple kids committed suicide, uh, claimed it was listening to Judas Priest album, and it was the song uh, Better By You, Better Than Me, third song on side one. That was the song they were saying had uh, backwards messaging that told them to do it. And the two kids went to a playground and had a double suicide, whatever they call it. The one kid shot himself in the head, and the other kid picked up a gun, shot himself, but he didn't die. He was still alive. He was all face was all totally deformed, and uh, they they did a documentary on that, and they interviewed him, and he said Judas Priest was the reason he did it. But uh, they went to court, and Priest won. You know that they looked in the kid's background. There was history of. Uh, suicide in his family and drug problems and alcoholism and all those family malfunctions. But this album, if you ask most bands, people, this is one of Priest's best albums I think they've ever done. Uh, great album. This is, I consider this like one of the first pure metal albums. I mean, there's a lot of metal albums before that, but this one solidified it. Now, you, had you discovered them by this point? Or? Um, no, no, unfortunately I didn't. I still did not know about Priest at the time this had come out. Um, I've heard of the name. That was about it. Uh, this is just an EP of Take on the World. Uh, this is a clear vinyl EP of Evening Star. It's a clear see-through vinyl. See, it's a... Uh, I miss vinyl. Where, where is it? Uh, you can see it's a clear... Wow. It's not a picture disc. It's a clear see-through single of Evening Star. This is another uh, Priest Live bootleg. This is actually, this is the first live bootleg album I ever bought in my vinyl collecting days. I bought this one. The sound was horrible. I think I paid a lot of money for it at the time and I was disappointed in it, but now I wouldn't part with it for anything as I learned to appreciate the bootleg recordings in due time. Uh, this here, Killing Machine. This album is entitled Hellbent for Leather in the U.S. Uh, other countries, this is a Japanese pressing, it's considered Killing Machine, had two different titles, this had one less song, didn't have Green Man Alishi on it. Uh, this is the album uh, where I first heard Judas Priest was this album here, 78, Hellbent for Leather. Um, this album they were changing a little bit, um, like Stained Class and Sin After Sin and Sad Wings, songs were a lot more complicated and the... Uh, the lyrics were a lot more in depth, but on this album here they started making the lyrics a little simpler. Uh, they were changing a bit. I mean, I thought it's still an excellent album, but they were becoming, they were uh, changing a little bit here. I think uh, the more anthem type songs on here, you know, uh, 
they, I can tell a slight change in the band on this album, but it's a pretty good album, Hellbent for Leather. It's the first uh, first time I heard Judas Priest, and I, I this ain't the one that quite hooked me. I heard it, and I thought it was pretty good. Um, so here's just a box set. Well, of, what happened? Uh, that's the record you went to. Where was the store around um, here? Yeah, this one I'm not not quite. This one no quite one that oh, okay. did it. Yeah, um, this here's is a box set. This is the one that did it. This uh, was the live album that came out preceding the Hellbent for Leather album, and this is where I really took notice of the band. And uh, I bought I got this album for Christmas. Um, you know, my mom, my parents, I gave them a list of what I wanted. I got this for Christmas, and my stereo was broken at the time, so I used to listen to this on one of those furniture stereo wooden things with the sliding top and. I used to listen to it over and over and over again, and I thought that this album, I mean, uh, this was a pure metal album. Songs in here like uh, Exciter, Victim of Changes, Tyrant, Genocide, Green Man Alishi, um, the whole album's a classic. I know there's a lot of stories about this album that it really wasn't. This is a live album, but uh, there's a lot of talk that should be called Unleashed in the Studio because uh, a lot of it was done in the studio, but I think this album here is the one that, you know, if I had to pick a heavy metal album and say, here's heavy metal, I would hand this album to somebody and say, this is what heavy metal is. Um, here they had the, this is like when they first uh, established in the look, all the leather. Well, actually, they started on Hellbent for Leather, but here they're wearing all the leather, the Flying V guitars, a trademark in metal, you know, Halford with the shades, the leather, the chains, studs, motorcycle. That's like, this is probably the metal image. This is what they uh, a lot of metal singers and you know, based their image on was definitely what Halford brought into it. This is where all the leather and denim and leather and spandex and all that I feel really started. So what was that like for your, your? That was an import album. No, this was a regular domestic album. Um, the actually this is the import. It's a Japanese version. Comes with four more songs on it. But now you so you asked your parents to get that for you for Christmas, yeah. Did they know what you know what they were going to unleash? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I was getting more and more into music, but um, you know, after this album, this was a live album, and there's a, most of the songs in this live album are on the previous albums I've showed you a lot off of Sad Wings of Destiny, um, uh, Sin After Sin, Hellbent for Leather. Uh, there wasn't really anything from Staying Class on here, I don't believe. Oh yeah, except for Exciter was off staying class but um, this introduced me to the older albums when I got into this one I went back and got these older albums that I had shown you and really familiarized myself a lot with the band at that point um, so how much album. money were you spending at this point? Was it well at, at this point in my uh, metal buying days I didn't have a job I was in like junior high school I'd do what I could to get money mow the lawn do chores get an allowance and I would save all my allowance so I could uh, buy metal albums me and my friends would all buy different ones because none of us had jobs. That way, we all had everything. You know, if each one of us took turn, you know, bought something different, we could all, all listen to them and tape them and whatnot. But somehow, uh, you still wound up with everything anyway. Oh, eventually, yeah. <laughs> eventually, I got everything. Um, this is just a Japanese pressing. This is a bootleg live album. Okay, here is the uh, the next uh, studio album after Unleashed in the East, and. Uh, this kind of where Hellbent for Leather was changing, this is what it changed to. And um, they were still playing metal music. It was just a lot more simpler. The lyrics were more basic and not as deep. And it was, I think they, they were definitely aiming for the U.S. They were trying to break in the U.S. And this album did it. Uh, the big songs off this is Living After Midnight and Breaking the Law. That was probably the first two big priest songs in the U.S. And they got some uh, radio play before this, but this album here was their American breakthrough album. I mean, they're doing good in Europe on the other ones, but this one here definitely, again, they definitely have the metal look on there. I think it's a pretty decent album. The songs are a lot more basic and all, but there's you know songs on here like Rapid Fire and Steeler and uh, Metal Gods, Grinder. A lot of them are, um, you know, priest classics. What year was that? 1980. This is 1980 that this album came out. Actually, I started my magazine Grinder. I started, I picked the priest title to start it. That's where I got it from. But, um, you know, if you look back over these priest albums, a lot of their song titles, there are bands, you know, with the, there's a band called Steeler, you know, there's a band called Grinder, and uh, on their other albums, Ripper, Running Wild, Genocide, Tyrant, there's bands with all those names. So, an Exciter. A lot of they influence, you know, you can probably pick up that Unleashed in the East album I was showing you, and I can show you a band that has 
that took their song to their name of their band from that album. Um, Many bands. Oh yeah, just about. You know, like I said, um, I'll look back. Unleashed in the East. You know, there's a band called Exciter from Canada. There's a band called Running Wild from Germany. There's a Sinner from Germany. There's a Ripper from Texas. Don't know if Green Man Alicia or Diamonds are Us Victim of Changes, but there's Genocide from Japan, Tyrant from California. I mean, you could go through the Priest albums and just lift song titles that bands eventually named themselves after. So that's another influential thing. Uh, this here is just another bootleg album. Um, this is a, what is this, another pressing? Oh, this is like a two-in-one pressing of Killing Machine and British Steel. It's a double album. Nothing unique. Here's just a EP of the Ripper, their old record label, just trying to cash in on Priest. Uh, promotional Living After Midnight single. This was sent around before British Steel came out. They just sent it around to their record uh, radio stations promoting it. Uh, here's the UK single of Living After Midnight. Okay, here's the single of Hot Rockin', which is off the uh, next studio album. Do you remember the song to. list from that first show? or did, Were you want a person who writes down song lists? Something no, like I don't. You know, I, I did a couple times here and there. That seems, but, always seems really extreme to me when people, like, got notepads where they yeah. like, write down. The, yeah, I don't. I never really did that too much. Um, Hard to enjoy the concert. Yeah. You keep having to write down a... <laughs> exactly. Uh, here's just another promo heading out to the highway, promoting the upcoming Priest album, Point of Entry, here. It's two different versions. This is the uh, European pressing of Point of Entry, and this is the uh, U.S. pressing of Point of Entry. This album was changed again from British Steel. This is a little bit more lighter. Um, at the time this album came out, I liked it a lot, but now I look back over their collection, I consider it, you know, kind of down the list. Um, it was just, um, I don't know, at the time, it, you know, there's a couple good songs on here a lot, like I think Solar Angels, Desert Plains are pretty good songs, but they had hits with Heading Out to the Highway and Hot Rockin' were a couple big hits off here. They toured in 81 with Iron Maiden on uh, Maiden's second album, Killers, was out, same time this came out, and so that was a great bill for 81, Priest and Maiden. They played the Civic Center in Baltimore, they played the Cap Center in D.C. Um, this is a concert, my first opportunity of almost seeing Priest. Uh, parents wouldn't let me go. My brother and his friends were going. They were 10 years older than me. I was probably 13 at the time or something like that. And for obvious reasons, she didn't want me going with him and his crowd. Um, I was not too happy. I remember I was uh, pretty upset about that. And I was mad at my brother. But, hey, you know, that's just how bad I wanted to see him. Um, that was uh, heading out to the highway. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, it was just another promo live thing. It was only given to radio stations. Super Groups Night on the Road. This is a promo album. It was a concert series on the radio. This is the actual vinyl of the radio show. Were you a big 98 Rock fan or that station? Or a um, it was okay. They went through a lot of changes. You know, it depends what they would play. They would just, problems with corporate radio, they're only told a couple hit songs to play, and they'll play them over and mm -hmm. over and over. They never really dug, like, deep into the album. Um, this here is another live bootleg album. That picture taken was from the Hot Rockin' video. Uh, here's the next studio album they did, and this was a great album, Screaming for Vengeance, a big step forward from Point of Entry. Um, this album really, I mean, Hellion Electric Eye, that song was just totally metal song that I totally got into, this whole album. Uh, this is the first tour I saw, Priest 82. They, again, Maiden played with them. Uh, Baltimore Civic Center, first time seeing them. And it was a big, um, I was telling you before, it was a big concert memory for me because I was like at this time I was like junior high school these guys were my icons I listened to them day in and day out and it was a big deal for me to to see these guys on that tour um, MTV also showed a concert of them uh, around this uh, around this time what year was that uh, 82 the album MTV showed a concert uh, from it and there so that was a yeah. <laughs> so actually I think uh, that footage you have from on the end of Heavy Metal Parking Lot of the band playing may have came from that 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 concert tour. You're right. That's probably they must have released it on. Uh, yeah, they released it on videotape. Video. Yeah, they did. We, did. we took it from a video. Uh, I'll finish going through. Um, here's just a EP, and then their old record label just trying to cash in on some of their stuff. Same with this, like a white vi white vinyl um, Tyrant 12 inch. Uh, neat for the collector, but songs were all issued before. Just a old company cash in. Same with this inter this interview album's a promotional Jim Ladd interview show. It was a radio show. 
uh, another Jim Ladd album. Uh, King Biscuit Flower Hour radio concert used to come on all the time. I forgot, that guy Jim Ladd. Yeah, he used to interview the band. Yeah, it was like, called Interview was the name of his show. Is he still around? I don't know. I have no idea. That stuff, I remember they used to, yeah, they get all those bands and they, they, yeah, they press them onto vinyl. Yeah, yeah, like these here, were. this is what the radio would actually play. This is like the King Biscuit Flower Hour of a concert. Um, here's like a, a best of tour picture disc. They only sold that on tour, pretty rare. Bootleg album from the uh, show they did at the US Festival. Another compilation album of um, their old record label cashing in on them. What do you think of the album design? I mean, that kind of was there a particular artist that they always worked with? On this album here, this guy Doug Johnson did this Screaming for Vengeance album. Uh, it was just the American pressing. Yeah, they used him on a couple albums. Um, this is the Hellion. Was the name of the creature on here? A lot of bands started taking on um, kind of. Uh, mascots or something. Priest never quite did, but they started this mechanical looking uh I guess Iron bird. Maiden had Eddie. Eddie, yeah, exactly. Uh here's another bootleg album from eighty one, I believe. Another live bootleg album, another live bootleg album. Another bootleg live album. Uh this is a bootleg like picture disc interview picture disc album. Uh here's the next studio album after screen for Vengeance, Defenders of the Faith. 1984. Again, uh, similar artwork, just a different different creature on here. I think this was called the Metallion, the creature on here. Um, this is a pretty good, pretty good album. Uh, another one of my priest's favorite songs is The Sentinel, which is the fourth song on here. Great classic epic album. Free Will Burning was pretty, uh, pretty ripping. Eat Me Alive was pretty good. It was a pretty good album. Not quite as what Screaming for Vengeance was, but still a decent album. And... Uh, and this was 1984. Metal was, you know, going on pretty well. It was starting to change around 84 a little bit, which we'll get to in a couple of records here. Um, this is a very rare album. This goes for, uh, I bet, 100 to $150. It's a Japanese-only um, best-of album. Came out. Nothing rare on it, just a rare special Japan DJ um, copy. Here's another bootleg album, live from 84, Rob with a Woman. Uh, I think that was taken, they did a photo session of uh, Playboy, I mean, a penthouse women with Rob. And uh, I guess this, you know, he doesn't look too comfortable there with a woman. I don't know. That was all uh, stage, whatever, I guess. Now, when, was it in penthouse? Did they actually print the print the picture? No, it was, uh, it wasn't, they just, uh, I think Priest management hired, got a couple penthouse models just to take some shots with Priest. So. What year was that, you think? Uh, I'm going to say 83, 84. Mm. So all this is going on in the mid-80s? Yeah. yeah. So 80s was a real metal heyday. Yeah, that's when it started coming to life and becoming popular and radio accessible in the U.S. For sure, big time. Uh, bands like... ACDC, Priest, Sabbath, uh, Ronnie James Dio, eventually in 83's solo albums, um, made in, that was all getting radio airplay. Even Van Halen was kind of tossed into that uh, category. You know, I could see their earlier albums had a type of, a uh, little bit of a metal sound to it. But yeah, this is the era, 80's where that metal stuff started getting big. And, um, yeah, that's the, I, you gotta have to give, you, give us a whole, like, you know, uh, reason for reason that. For yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, go I'll, ahead. I'm going to run out of going. battery in okay. a second, but I'll switch I'll finish going through. Yeah. Um, it's just an EP, a single, a Free Will Burning off the Defenders album. It's promotional Love Bites picture disc. has the bite taken out of it just, uh, in the corner. Just a promotional uh, item. Another EP single. Another single that's coming with, like, a stencil and stuff in it. Different pressings had different stuff. Another King Biscuit album. Another bootleg album. Okay, here we are. This is Turbo. This is um, the time this came out, 1986. Uh, metal was changing a lot. It was branching off into two different directions. The record labels were stepping in, making the music more accessible, more commercial uh, sounding, more radio friendly, more lyrics were getting a lot less, very simplistic, juvenile. Um, a lot of bands were going this direction. That was the sound, how the metal scene was changing. And Priest, to compete with this movement, had to, um, they did this album. And I think it's, this is probably one of my least favorite Priest albums ever. I think they just totally sold out on this album. They were experimenting.
Well, this you were saying about turbo being a kind of a sell yeah. Um, well, I don't know. It's sold out. We're talking about the, the metal. Yeah, metal. And the, at this point, '86 between Defenders of the Faith and Turbo, there was two years gone by. You know, '85. You know, Tur Defenders came out in '84. They toured on that album, and then they were silent pretty much until '86. They did a couple like benefit shows, I think for Live Aid or or Us Festival or something. But the Turbo album here between '84 and '86, the metal had changed a lot. Um, it, the mainstream metal broke off into two different directions. One direction, the metal was getting heavier, faster, aggressive, tuned down more, just really raw and aggressive. Where the other other direction, the metal was getting more cleaned up, more polished, more radio friendly, more accessible to a bigger crowd, selling more albums. And um, Priest, to compete with that, decided to choose that direction. And doing so, they... Um, just the lyrics completely change. The lyrics on here are very juvenile, I would say. Stuff like um, parental guidance and, um, you know, uh, private property and all that kind of stuff. The lyrics are just very juvenile. They were just aiming for a younger, more radio-friendly crowd. And metal was going in that direction. The bands were wearing fancier clothes. They weren't as scraggly looking. They were using hairspray and bandanas and... Uh, the spandex, just they were actually in a lot of way, a lot of bands were becoming more feminine looking, I would think, with the hairspray and the feathered hair, and um, it was just becoming more accessible, more polished, more cleaned up. And Priest went in that direction for financial reasons. It did this album did good, um, sold well. They, you know, sold out to tours all across the world. But for the true metal fan, a lot of people felt that they had betrayed uh, the traditional metal thing and went in this direction, and. Uh, I could see why they did it to sell albums, but a lot of the true fans feel as though that they had kind of left. You what know, was your feeling kind of when you got this? Was what year was this? Eighty six. So this was when we did Heavy Metal Parking Lot. Exactly, it's so when this we did eighty six. Yes, it was the tour. A lot of the a lot of the regular metal fans were still at this tour just to you know priests were just to support priests because what they've done out of respect for all the good music they've done, but. Um, this uh, and, and this also opened doors since they were becoming more accessible. It opened doors to a whole new fan base because they were becoming more fr uh, radio friendly and the music was more polished. A lot more people were getting accessible to it. You know, I know a, a lot of people that didn't like the earlier pre stuff. It was too raw and too heavy or too, you know. But when this came out, I know a lot of people that it was more, they liked it more. It was more lighter and more gentle or whatever you want to call it it was a lot more accessible and it opened doors to a whole lot a whole new fan base for them on this album um to uh pick back up where i left off um this is just another again rob with a woman this is rob's turbo look you can see the feathered hair the fancy clothes but uh there he is with another woman i don't know what's going on there this is just a bootleg live yeah you can see their look here has drastically changed this is turbo they're just a lot more I don't know, <laughs> groomed looking or something, I don't know. Um, other Turbo EP, another bootleg um, album. This was a live album they did after Turbo. Uh, I didn't think too much of it. It was very studio done. It was done on the Turbo tour. Didn't really think too much of that one. This is another bootleg album here. And uh, this is uh, Ram It Down. This is the next studio album after Turbo. It, uh, it was, you know, at this point, this was 88, and since 86, metal had changed again. It took them two more years to do an album, and um, a lot of that hairband stuff and that polished metal I was talking about uh, was kind of dying off at this year, uh, at, at this album. A lot of that was, a lot of the bands had, you know, that scene was only happening for a couple years, and a lot of the bands were were fading out, weren't, weren't selling too well, and that's when Priest did Ram It Down album. And this album, they were staying, they were going in a, back to their metal roots. And, um, you know, it slightly it did halfway through that. It go, um, but it was still had that turbo feel to it. This album is kind of in limbo for the Priest fans, it's like in between the metal and the polished stuff. So this album did okay. Um, I consider it an average album. I like it better than Turbo, but still it it's down the, the bottom of the list there with the rest. It's a pretty cool tight. That's a pretty cool cover. Yeah, I definitely. The cover was cool. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. And I think that's the one that we actually got backstage, and that, that's the show that's we the actually tour, got yeah. to see the, see the concert. Yeah, I saw them a couple times on this tour also, 88. Never missed them. Now, here's the album that put Priest back. Well, this is an EP from it, Painkiller. Uh, this album here, 
go ahead and bring it out. Uh, yeah. Actually, that's all right. You okay. Pull it right here on your. Okay. This album is the Return Priest album. I remember I was out one night. Um, came in, I don't know, 2 or 3 in the morning, Headbangers Ball was on MTV, and um, I turned it on and the song Painkiller was playing, and I was, I had a few beers that night, but I still, you know, I knew what was going on, I was watching the TV, I was like, that can't be Priest, it looked like Halford, and the drums were just pounding, you know, and um, they had gotten rid of the drummer Dave Holland and got Scott Travis in the band, and I think this album's a masterpiece, I think it is, um, this album gained Priest fans all back and new. I mean, it, it's more of a speed metal type style. It's double bass drum. It's fast, but the rip and guitar leads all over it. Halford's wailing on the vocals, uh, screaming his balls off. And um, I think this is a, a great staple in Priest's career. This brought them, gained them all their respect and, and everything back to them. This album, they did a successful tour selling out all the big arenas in 1990 on this album. Came back around in 91, in uh, which Halford uh, left the band uh, after the last tour on this album. But uh, this album was a, a great album, definitely. This surpasses the last few they did by far. So it brought everybody back to brought, the Priest. It brought everyone back to Priest and the metal. This was 90. The metal was starting to become popular again, some of the regular metal. You know, around the time the grunge scene was going on, too, people still wanted to hear metal, and this album was did very well for him. Didn't get much radio play, um, a little bit, but not too much. A lot of this time, at this point, there was a lot of the underground metal was becoming popular. Bands like Anthrax and and Exodus and a lot of and Metal Church and a lot of these underground bands were signed to majors, Man of War and stuff like that. And there was a lot more college stations around playing metal, a lot more, you know, lesser powerful stations than a 98 Rock or something. But, they, you know, they got airplay a lot on those kind of stations. Stuff like that. This brought them back into it. And this is the last album they did with Rob Halford. Um, this was just an EP from the album, another EP from the album. Uh, Korean pressing of a best of album. That shot's taken um, from the Painkiller tour. Oh, yeah? That's yep. great. That's from the Painkiller tour. You can see they were back to the leather spikes and the. but definitely back to the metal uh, image there. And this was just uh, an EP from a best of album. This is another best of called Metalworks. And this is a live album they did with uh, Ripper Owens. Right before this, they did an album called Jugulator, which was several years after Painkiller. And that album, I don't really care for it a whole lot. I think they lost a lot of their roots. They were going for a more um, modern sound, kind of like Pantera-ish or something like that. A little. And Ripper Owens is a great singer. I know I was familiar with his stuff before Priest. He was a great singer, but on the album, he sings a lot more lower, monotone. Um, just to fit in, you know, kind of give them a current sound. And right now, Priest are getting ready to uh, release a new album here in the next couple months. So you don't even have Jugulator? Uh, not on vinyl. I have it on oh, CD. Uh, at this point, uh, right before Painkiller was in, that's like an import pressing of um, uh, Painkiller. Uh, Painkiller never came out in the U.S. on CDs at this point. I mean, on vinyl. At this point, vinyl was gone and CDs have taken over. So these were just imports, the uh, bottom ones, because vinyl was still coming out in, in Europe over there. I see. So that's my quick uh, run. That's my quick rundown of Judas Priest. Uh, I could go in hours about everything, <laughs> if need be, but uh, that's my quick synopsis of the band. That's so there, but there it, uh, th and that's really uh, you know the thing is for us. I mean, with the heavy metal parking lot, that just we were very fortunate that we got them. I think. Yeah, because you called them right at the. Um, Right at their transition, they still had their old fans, and they were getting new fans. And uh, I think on Turbo, you know, some of the old fans were still going to the shows. Maybe didn't care for the album, but were going to the shows. And all their new fans that the doors had opened up to were at the shows. So uh, they were uh, they were selling out arenas at that. They were very popular at that point, no doubt about it. Um, this here is a Judas Priest British Steel um, cardboard display promoting the British Steel album folds here and um, yeah this was something they would hang in the record store one of my many priest uh, memorabilia I have a ton of it um, there's a priest uh, British Steel carnival mirror um, a lot of different promo stuff here like here's a painkiller promotional saw blade CD they did um, Judas Priest barbed wire necklace <laughs> so, uh, from the painkiller era Judas Priest study wristband this is probably from 81 or 82, I can't recall. Did they sell that stuff at the shows? Yeah, 
yeah, some of the shows, like Saxon wristband. Uh, different Alice Cooper memorabilia. I have uh, a lot of promotional stuff here, like a Motorhead condom from the tour, ACDC earplugs, Kiss belt buckle. Um, I have a pieces of a, a guitar at Wendy Williams of the Plasmatic sawed up um, from wow. the 930 Club, 88. Pieces of a TV that Wendy Williams had smashed up with a sledgehammer. You bought this from collectors? No, I was different shows. Oh, um, wow. People had given them to me, I or I got them. Collected them somewhere about. This came from one of the guitarists. I can't remember who. A friend of mine gave me that. Um, different patches, priest patches, all all kind of different, you know, stuff I used to wear on my jackets and stuff like that. Um, some backstage passes. Different shows. You buy those from people? No, or? I used to get them from being part of, you know, write oh, for you, magazines oh, and stuff that right? like that. So yeah. you go backstage? Yeah. At like a Priest show? Yeah, I didn't meet Priest though. This was for um, Megadeth open for Priest in '91, and I was on Megadeth's uh, guest list or something like that. That was a photo pass. So you weren't able to? Um, you wouldn't? You never met Priest when? They no, were... I didn't. I the only time I met was Halford uh, last October out in out in um, out in uh, Minnesota. That's neat. So then you can kind of look better, looks better in the with, uh, dark. So now that's that was Priest's trademark. Yeah, uh, kind of. That um, the neon. I I was uh, I wanted to make neon guitars, and uh, Priest at the end of their concerts would, as they're just belting out the last notes, Halford would stand in the middle with the guitars on each side of them, and they would hold the guitars over his head, uh, crossing them like that. And I just thought it'd be a neat uh, the guitar thing. I mean, I didn't make this for because of Priest, but it influenced my design. I just uh, made them and put them up there. The first Priest show I have in here somewhere, and um, yeah, one of the first big arena shows I ever saw was Black Sabbath on the Mills tour. But prior to that, I'd been to some shows. I've seen like Blackfoot and a couple other shows, but that was the first like big arena metal show. Where was the Black Sabbath Mob Rules tour? That was at um, the Baltimore Civic Center. And uh, they, they also played the Cap Center, but I only saw them at the Civic Center on that tour. They played like two nights in a row. But yeah, I looked through all these ticket stubs, and it's kind of a, you know, like, here's the pre-show I was talking about, 1982. Um, tickets were only $11 at, uh, in Baltimore. And, um, you know, I can look through here. You see um, Maiden from the Cap Center, ACDC, uh, even some Hammerjacks ticket stubs. There's Robin Trower, Vinnie Vincent. Um, so what was it? What, what did it cost back? Like like to go to a Capital Center show um, uh, in the mid '80s. I mean, do you have the Turbo ticket there? Uh, let me see the if Judas let me see if I do. Uh, I'm gonna look through this real quick. These are in no specific order. Um, Gamelon, Sabbath, Soundgarden. Let me see here. Priest in '86. Um, what was it? There's. What was? Do you know the date of that show in '86 when you did uh, Heavy Metal Parking Lot? I think Park May 5th. Okay, this was August 27th of '86, but this was from the Baltimore Baltimore show. Um, oh, here it is. How about May 31st? Really? May 31, '86, Cap Center. Who's it was who? 14:50. Wow, I always thought it was May 5th. Hmm. It says May 31st. That's the first ticket stub I've ever seen. So it doesn't say the opening band. Or... No, it just says uh, Capital Center, Judas Priest, Saturday 8 p.m. evening. May 31, 1986, 1450. It was definitely a Saturday, so that must have been it. Um, I might have another place to research that for you. Well, like, I, just saw, I, I always tour. took somebody else's uh, word, uh, word on it. Word yeah, but um, and so then they came back to the Civic Center. Yeah, like a uh, couple of months later. Wow. Instead of hitting the same area tw two nights in a row, I'll show you some more of my collection stuff. Um, these are just more boxes of cassettes. Um, these here are tour books and promo books from just all over the world. Jethro Tull, I like a lot of hard rock too. Alice Cooper, Maiden, Tall. Jethro Tull were my band. I saw that. Yeah. I was there at that uh, Bursting Out tour. Yeah, more, I got, you know, Priest programs from all over the world. A lot of stuff's worth a lot of money. Um, some of my Cooper books and all are worth a lot of money. Priest, there's a, there's a turbo picture for it. You can see how they, um, how they look there. <laughs> you know, definitely a lot different there than if you look at like painkiller or something like here's a Japanese um, tour book of priest this is probably from 78 um, this goes this uh, this is probably worth a um, hundred dollars or so 
Here's like another Priest Japanese tour boat from 78. And um, just tons of tour books I've collected or shows I was at. I'm a big Thin Lizzy collector. I have a huge Lizzy collection. Blue Oyster Cult's another favorite. Just tons and tons of, you know, Slayer, Metallica, Blue Oyster Cult, Anvil, another band I'm into a lot, Sabbath, Slayer, Bar, a lot of all kind of stuff. These are all tour books, all more or less. And one of my prized priest collection. Um, oh, here's some more stuff. Here's some stuff I used to have on my vest in uh, in like junior high school. I had this priest patch on the back of my jacket. Then I was getting a more underground metal, like this accept patch was on my jacket. I would. And here's a here's an old priest bootleg shirt I had from '81. One of them bootleg shirts someone sells in the parking lot. I used to wear this religiously. That was the front. This was the back, and the shirt became all tattered and torn, so I cut off the designs and saved them still. So I still have... Uh, so that was long sleeve? Yeah, it was a three-quarter sleeve shirt. Wow. God, I'd love um, to... That would be the hippest <laughs> thing to wear. I mean, I wonder... There's got to be, like... They were just, like, so over the top. You yeah. Know? They were just so... Yeah, this, that... this was a bootleg shirt, a priest. Again, I saved a design. This was an official tour shirt from the British Steel Tour. Uh, unfortunately, I just have the design. I cut them up. I started saving them after that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, um, yeah, these are just all of tour books and various collectible stuff from from all over. Made Encounters, a loudness promo pack. But one of my, let me see if I can find it here, um, one of my pri prized um, priest collectibles. I don't know anybody else that has this. I don't know anybody else that's ever seen it. I got it from England. It's a tour book from Judas Priest autographed from the Rockarola album, their very first album. And um, you can see they look a lot different there. There's Rob, Rob and Glenn, Ian and KK and the drummer at the time, um, John Hinch. But yeah, there's a early shot of Rob right there. And that's probably 75, something like that. This is one of my, one of my prize priest collectibles that got I've got. That from England? Yeah, from just some dealer in England one time. I was at the right, right spot at the right time on that. Um, I'll show you going this way. I'll show you a couple other things besides all the, um, besides all those uh, cassette tapes that I've traded and accumulated over the years. I've also a video trader, and these boxes here are just full of nothing but it's all music. All these boxes here are just full of videotapes, and it's all TV, TV broadcasts, um, bootleg concerts, um, stuff like that. It's all. It's, oh, it's all, all music. Oh man, it's all okay. music. Let me see. What what are? I mean, well, let me here. I'll pop another one open for you. That's all off TV. No, oh, it's yeah. some of it's bootleg. I it's see. varies. It's pro shot, bootleg shot, you name it. But all them boxes are completely filled with broom. It's all music. Every tape full. And I've watched every one of them tapes and labeled every one of them and probably wrote song listings for every one of them. Of course, this was done over many a years. <laughs> Whenever I get a tape, I thoroughly watch it and label it all up and put it in my collection. Except I can get behind like you saw that um, upstairs, that box. I, once you start to get behind, it's all over. So that's my video. How would you stay on top of it? I mean, how, with having a having a life, and, a, and this was your life. Well, yeah, I stayed on top. I try to have a life. I do have a life outside. I like to do a lot of other things. But yeah, you know, I get a tape. You know, I try to watch it in a day or two, within a couple of days of getting it. That way, I never got those. I'm way behind now. I mean, what's here? What's on some of this? Like, like, um, there's like Slayer from San Francisco, Mentors from Lemoore, New York. Um, you wouldn't? Sh would you shoot these, or were they uh, shot by some, somebody else? Um, I've shot a couple, but a lot of them were shot by other people. You know, some of them are like from TV broadcasts and stuff like that. Um, just all kind of stuff, from ACDC, King Diamond to Death to Stormtroopers of Death to the Accused, GBH, Bad Brains. Everything. Yeah, uh, were electric you a Bad Brains fan? Yeah, I was definitely. They're a pretty, pretty intense band. I like them a lot. I saw them actually when I was a kid. You know, at DC Space. You know, back yeah. in like 1980 or 79. Yeah, but this is most of my video. You saw that box upstairs, and that box upstairs is a result of not keeping up on it. This here is most of my old shirts. These are pretty small. These are ones 
I was probably wearing in junior high school. And, um, you know, before I show you the ones I'd cut up, but after a while, I just, I just started saving them. And a lot of these are ones I wore religiously in school. I bought this shirt at that Mob Rolls show at uh, the Baltimore Civic Center in 82. Um, <laughs> I used to wear this all the time in school. See, it's pretty faded. Yeah. Size medium. I'll be lucky if I can get this over my head at this point. <laughs> hey, you know what? It may, you know, it's crazy. It may fit. But yeah, this was one of them three-quarter sleeve shirts. Yeah. Um, I do have some pre-shirts. Um, to take a look through and see what's all. Um, there's a mentor shirt. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got some big pre-shirts. I'm sure I do. They're probably just not in this box. Well, I'm going to show you before I forget. Um, where is... Let's see if it's in here. Um, there's a lot of my autographs and stuff. Black flag. Is that yeah, that's Henry, Henry Rollins, Rollins autograph, yeah. Slayer's autographs. Let me, uh, I was going to show you... Let's see what we got here. Remember these t-shirts, the iron on glitter yeah. shirts? This was like that Unleashed in the East cover. Wow. Unused, of course. It's a lot of my Thin Lizzy stuff. Now, Please. he died pretty young, didn't he? Yeah, uh, Phil. He had pneumonia yeah. or something? Yeah, it was, uh, he had drug abuse, but it broke down his... Uh, he didn't die OD, but he broke down from... Uh, the immune system. Yeah, immune system broke down. There's not a shot of Rob with a, a chick. Wow. That yeah. was that. And cream. Yeah. What was, what was your favorite rock and roll magazine? Um, mostly underground ones. Like, the big ones, though, were... Size to, I mean, the early 80s, I would buy Hit Parade or Circus, Cream. Cream was pretty neat when they covered a lot of bands. The other ones didn't. Those are great uh, here pictures we go. there of, like, Rob Halford. And yeah, Rob. just... Uh, um, that's, that's, that's from the Painkiller era. Some uh, backstage passes, another priest thing. Yeah, these were just different, uh, different shots. Got like countless books of stuff like this. Priest trading cards. Um, my friend, this was the album cover of Jugulator, the one with Ripper Owens, and my friend made a parody of it called Jerkulator. He didn't like it, so he uh, doctored it up a little bit. But um, there's an old shot of Priest from probably 77, 70. Let me grab that other box. Of sure, shirts. sure. Rob Halford. You're, uh, not that there's any money yet, but you're hired. You're, uh, like, uh, you're definitely a consultant <laughs> on this like, project. Um, share my collection off, anyone, you know. You're, you're consulting you're on this side. Yeah, this, 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 this is a. This is a. This is great. This is great. Let's pull it up. Let's pull it up. Yeah, yeah, I've just got. I've just got countless stuff. Oh, this is another this is box of shirts. Another box of shirts here. here. This is a box. Oh, this cool. is a box. How yeah. oh, cool. Yeah. Full of. Full wow, of. Wow! Look at that. Wow! Look at that. Man, oh man, man, oh man. Oh, man. Like, 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 o